Captain Estimer. Here. Erfron Nazarello. And Jane Moran present. So we do have a quorum. Okay, so um, anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond um, when I call your name. And this will be include the staff as well. Dave Del Torrio. Oh, there's Bob. I'm here today. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Elaine Lazarus. Um, here. Yeah. Um, let's see. Who else is here? Uh, Norman. Matt, what do you want to do? Like, just. You've got Norman on the uh, like, like, thing, Jane. Oh, okay. Norman. Come on, oh. And um, he's Michelle Murdoch just joined. Michelle Murdoch is here, and I believe, and um, Gary's connecting. Who else is from our <laughs> match? <Gary Ru Eight. laughs> yeah. Hello. Who's uh, Katie Davenport? I'm not sure. Can, can somebody ask her to mute? Background noise. Uh, Katie, thank you, Katie. Can hear us. Thank you. Yourself. That would be great. So good afternoon, everyone. This is the open meeting of the Upper Turtles Trail Committee, and it's being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with the executive order that stems the require meant of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The executive order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials is for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as the public body makes provisions through adequate alternative means to ensure interested members of the public and that they are provided a reasonable access to the deliberation of the meetings. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Upper Charles Trail Committee is convening via video um, with the, via Zoom, and it's posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and some att attendees are participating via video conference. So um, accordingly, please, uh, please be aware that members and others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you, that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided to the members of this body are available on the town's website via the web meeting calendar, unless otherwise noted, the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, unless I note otherwise. We are now turning our, to our first item on the agenda, before, but before we do though, I permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will invite board members to provide any comment or questions or motions. Please hold your name. Um, please hold until your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or your computer when you are not speaking. And please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields to the floor to you to and state your name before speaking. Um, if the members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking careful, uh, being careful to identify yourself. After the members have spoken, the chair will afford a public comment as follows. The chair will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all the public commentators, I will call each by name and afford three minutes for the, any comments. So we opened the public meeting and we will turn to the first agenda item. And let me first say by starting that we are very grateful that um, 
um, Gary Trundle, chair of the planning board is here tonight to share with us um, a verbal readout and actually share the um, results of the pedestrian public uh, safety survey that was recently taken. So um, Gary, it's all yours. And thank you again for sharing this information. All right. Thanks, Jane. And um, nice to see some familiar faces. And as a former member of the Upper Charles Trails Committee, it's always nice to be back with this group. I think you guys are doing great work and um, um, appreciate the opportunity to share. Um, Jane, just a quick question. How much time do I have in the agenda to go through this? And I can kind of shape my You can take as much time as it is before you have to leave. Um, I think the, the everyone is interested in hearing the information that you have. So we're really not pressed. All because. right. Um, what can you guys, can you guys, what screen do you see right now? Uh, pedestrian connectivity survey results by Gary. All right, yep. perfect. Yeah. All right, so um, a little bit of background. Um, the, the impetus for this survey was really twofold. Um, one is that the last couple of times that we've had sidewalk articles before us at, at annual town meeting, um, we have not been successful at, at pushing them through. And we felt that there might be some benefit as to going and collecting a little bit more data on, um, on, on how people use sidewalks and trails for that matter and, and, and help strengthen a case for future annual town meeting articles. The second piece of it stems from a, a subgroup of the planning board um, that was led by myself, by Jane, and by Dave Paul. And one of the objectives that we have in that group is to build out a, a, a broader pedestrian connectivity plan. And the idea behind this is, you know, rather than just kind of, uh, you know, in some ways similar to what this group is doing with a, a fairly specific charter, but um, you know, trying to figure out um, where we can strategically make investments um, in various means of, of, of non-automobile connectivity to, uh, you know, in, improve connectivity within, within Hopkinton. And so we've done sidewalk surveys in the past. This one's a little bit different. It's meant to be um, uh, a different approach. It's meant to, let me go to the next slide here. Um, you see the objectives first and foremost, we really tried to focus on understanding the underlying preferences and needs relative to non-vehicular connectivity in Hopkinton. And so you'll notice that we didn't ask people where we should put a trail, where we should put a sidewalk, um, because what we found in the past is that that becomes kind of whoever, whatever street gets the most votes in, then the, the, the survey supports that, that component. So um, we, we, we dug in on, on preferences, um, I already mentioned that we are hopeful that this will support uh, a connectivity plan. And third, that we're hopeful that this will help support some investments um, at annual town meeting, not this year, but the following year. Um, it was a web-based survey. Uh, I think overall, we were really happy with the response rate. We had 368 respondents in total. Um, I will note, this is what we call a branched survey. So um, the number of questions that each person got was somewhat dependent on how they answered previous questions. It just lets us drill in a little bit to some more specifics. Um, and my last point to make here is that just keep in mind, this is only a survey. Um, and we were really happy with the response rate. We think there's some statistical significance. Um, like all surveys, there is bias. Um, and, and I'd encourage people just to, to look at this as, as one of many data points um, because this isn't a single source of truth or information, um, albeit we think it's, it's, it is useful in how it's set up. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit on a couple of highlights. And I think just from having gone through this in the past, let me get through a, a couple of slides and key points, and then we'll take questions, because I might answer some questions uh, along the way. Um, Overall, and, and some of these are no surprise, uh, Hopkinton, certainly a very active community with, with broad interest in using trails and sidewalks for a multitude of purposes. Um, more than 85% of respondents believe that more trails and sidewalks would improve mental and physical health. Again, not a, not a big surprise there, but pretty, uh, pretty meaningful, I think, a very large percentage. Um, respondents want to invest in both sidewalks and trails of varying surfaces. So we looked at different uses and different needs, and there's a, a lot of variability there, but 
Um, it would be foolish to say that everybody wants stone dust or everybody wants single track or everybody wants pavement. Uh, the reality is, is that people do want a mix. Um, we did see that overall respondents have a slight preference for paved surfaces, but they generally desire both paved and gravel, or you know, we use the term gravel cart path, but um, you know, gravel stone dust in some capacity. Um, fitness runners, walkers are kind of the recreational users had a strong preference um, to be on, on trails or paths located away from the street. So they don't, you know, they, they'd much rather be away from the street than be on the street or, or on a sidewalk. And uh, I think this is really useful for us. So there's a generally a strong desire for, for loops of, of two to four miles. Um, and then lastly, uh, we saw that respondents that anticipate traveling for to walk to a business or to a school of some kind are actually willing to travel um, a reasonable distance of, of more than a mile in many cases. And so we'll, 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 we'll dig in a little bit further and, and we have some potential, some, some preliminary recommendations at the end. Um, just to give you a sense of the respondent set, and I think this is interesting, of those 368 respondents, 351 of them uh, desire to use sidewalks and or trails for fitness, walking, running, generally recreation uh, by foot. Um, we saw 75% of them would like to use trails and sidewalks to, to travel to a, a neighbor's house or an adjoining neighborhood. We saw 69% of them uh, would like to, to walk to a, a, a business of some kind. Uh, we saw 64% of them would like to bicycle in some capacity. And we saw 44% of them would like their kids to travel to school. And I just want to point out that not all the respondents have school age children, but just by the fact of the matter that in the survey, we identified 154 people that would like their kids to walk to school, I think is a, is a relatively meaningful number about how important trails and sidewalks are for kids, even in this day and age where most of them tend to get rides everywhere, every, every place they go. Um, we did see in general from a safety perspective and from a health perspective, um, almost everyone tends to avoid major roads out of concerns for safety. And uh, we've had a lot of discussion about some things that we can do to improve safety uh, on some of those roads. Uh, and as I mentioned, 85% believe that it would improve, uh, uh, either, that it would improve mental health and physical health. I think these are just some, some useful sound bites about, about how meaningful these types of um, recreation spaces can be. Um, we asked them just as a point of comparison, and I realize some people don't like this question, but we asked them how strongly they agree with the statement, Hopkinton provides better pedestrian, pedestrian, pedestrian connectivity than our neighboring towns. And you'll see majority of them neither agree nor disagree. I think they recognize that it's different, um, but we saw some, some slight preference on the, the disagree side of that equation. Um, my hypothesis to that would be that uh, you know, people think of the Milford Trail and they think of the Holliston Trail. And I think, candidly, they're, they're eager for the Upper Charles Trail. Um, but I think that's likely part of that response. Um, we also asked them if they would prefer to invest town resources in sidewalks versus trails. And again, realize this is a polarizing question. Um, and what you'll see here is that there, there really isn't a clear preference of one or the other. Um, people want both. Um, we didn't incorporate a cost component, which is a big one here. But, um, you know, in general, it, it, it supports that notion that, that people want both. Um, we also asked them, uh, what is your preferred walking or running surface? And um, I'll go through these one by one. Those, those recreational users, you'll see a, a pretty broad distribution. The dark green here is uh, a paved sidewalk. Um, the next green is a paved path off of the road. Um, the light green here is a gravel cart path. Uh, the teal is single track. And then the light blue is rural roads. And the, the Mediterranean blue is, is, uh, is, is main streets. And, you know, you, you'll see, again, uh, no surprise here, but, um, you know, they, they like single track. Um, they like gravel cart paths. Um, they like paved paths off the road. That was the most popular. Um, and they still value sidewalks as well. And I think that, that for these users, they're really open to pretty much anything as long as they are off the road. Um, as you look at these other uses, and we'll talk about cycling in a second, but as you look at traveling to neighborhoods, traveling to businesses, traveling to school, 
this is where you start to see that stronger preference for pavement. And I think this came as a surprise to a lot of people that that really have a, you know, that 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 have a strong, that, that might feel they have a strong preference for stone dust or for single track. Um, but again, I, I think, again, just, just my hypothesis and talking to people about this, um, I think there's some perceived benefit of, of year round use with pavement. Um, I think there's some perceived benefit of, of safety. And, and to some degree, I think that people like the idea of pavement because it, it may support additional uses, whether it be rollerblades or skateboards or, or, or that kind of thing. Um, but it was just, it was interesting to see that, that when people are traveling or commuting from one place to the next, there's a, a slight preference for pavement, whereas the recreational users really um, don't, don't have uh, so much of a preference. Um, a couple of other interesting tidbits here for those recreational users. Again, I thought it was interesting that that uh, almost two thirds of them are anticipate using a trail or sidewalk at least three times a week. You'll see the, the the estimated typical distance that they might travel, and you'll see that almost half of them are in that two to four mile range. And then you'll see a little bit more breakdown on on surface preference here. Um, as we get to the other uses traveling to other neighborhoods. We did a little different breakdown on, uh, on distances, just thinking that people that are walking for commuting purposes are probably not willing to go quite as far, but, um, uh, and, and again, you'll see the, the frequency here that again, almost two thirds of them anticipate traveling to neighbor, neighborhood houses um, at least three times per week. Traveling to business, this is interesting because uh, a lot of people have an interest in walking to a business but much lower frequency. Uh, almost three quarters of them would be one or fewer per week. And that's probably representative of how often we might go to uh, a business location, whether it be a, a restaurant or frozen yogurt or a pizza parlor or, or something to that effect. Um, but there was uh, a pretty strong willingness to travel a further distance to, to, to get there. Um, traveling to school, I think somewhat similar to businesses, um, and again, uh, you know, I guess only so many people live within a mile of the school. So it um, feels like people were willing to travel further distances. But again, not, not five days a week, really, uh, you know, two thirds of them were uh, a couple of days a week, which, you know, personally for me is probably representative of my family. Uh, every, you know, my, my two kids that don't drive do walk to and from school and it's a couple of days a week and it's um, somewhere in this, in this range. Uh, and then as you look at cyclists, again, a little bit lower frequency here. Um, and distance wise, roughly half of them like this uh, three to 10 mile distance as a, as a, preferred, um, as a preferred distance. Um, you also see within this group a, a very strong preference for um, paved paths away from the road. Um, so, um, you know, just uh, the, the dark blue and the, and the light blue. Um, indicating that that preference is a, is a top choice for the majority of folks. And again, I encourage people to sort of think, take their own personal preferences out of this. I'm a big cyclist. Um, this certainly does not reflect me, but I think that's the, the beauty of, of data is that um, this is representative of 234 users in Hopkinton. And this is a, you know, a summary of, of their thoughts. Um, we also had some, some open comments. Uh, and you know you see a couple of themes here in terms of general comments. We heard a lot of we heard a lot about safety. Um, you know whether it be the need for guardrails to to protect to protect. Um, you know sidewalks feel safer. It's, again, it's what people wrote. Uh, wider shoulders for bicycles. We heard a lot of comments about prioritizing trails. Um, we have enough sidewalks and trails. Need to get people using them. We should connect the ones we have. Prefer paved. Uh, prefer paths and wooded areas, don't pave existing trails. Um, we also heard uh, surveys poorly designed, so people didn't like it. And uh, I think on that theme of maintaining the ones we have. We also heard some open field comments about suggested areas, um, connect to the Milford Trail, um, you know, don't run Upper Charles Trail along Hayden Row, sidewalk needed on Lumber Street, um, connect West Hopkinton and Lake Maspinock, Spring Street area, Cedar Street, going down the hill, you get a sense of some, some different areas that just came up in the open comments. 
Um, and then my last slide is just um, some, some recommendations and next steps. Um, the first one here is, is really to focus on, on trail loops of, of two to five miles for runners and walkers. And I think this is interesting because we went into this project thinking that, you know, it was going to be really important to figure out how to connect, you know, Lake Whitehall with, with, with downtown. And maybe we need a sidewalk down Wood Street or something like that. And, and what we found was that that likely wouldn't get a whole lot of use and that people in general are looking for this two to five mile uh, range of which can give them a, you know, roughly a, a 30 to 60 minute walk or jog in some capacity. And I think that helps us maybe not so much with the Upper Charles Trail, but with other trail investments in town, you know, if there are ways that we can sort of connect the dots and, and build options of this length, that's something that would be viewed very favorably um, by uh, our citizens. Um, you know, I think that that uh, certainly a case to invest in paved infrastructure, being sidewalks and or paths that stem out from downtown and around schools. We see people that are using uh, sidewalks and paths for, for those purposes, for commuting purposes, really do have a, a strong preference for, for pavement. And, um, you know, that is the, it's where we have the, the bulk of our sidewalks today. But um, as we get into the vicinity around schools and businesses, it, it probably makes sense to, to invest in pavement in those areas. Um, you know, trails should have varied pavement based on location and anticipated use. Um, there's not, uh, again, people, people like both. Um, and I don't think we're gonna solve that anytime soon, but at least by using varied pavement and having some paved and, and some unpaved and some single track, um, it gives people options and they can kind of optimize uh, where they go based on what they like. Uh, a recommendation to identify three to 12 mile bike loops that are optimized for, for safety and ride quality. And I think there's probably some things we can do in terms of signage, potentially a little bit wider shoulder, um, uh, you know, and other things to, to improve safety for cyclists. We heard, I've always heard a lot of people that don't bicycle because they don't feel safe on the roads. Um, and this last one here is, is uh, improved safety features on highly traveled roads with pedestrians, um, you know, potentially including um, visibility improvements. So it could be everything from, from fog lines to help give people a little bit more space to, you know, even um, making sure that, that, you know, folks can be seen over the, the crest of a hill, um, that trees and shrubs are pulled away so that, you know, that, that pedestrians can see cars or that cars can see pedestrians. Um, and the next steps, you know, we're in the process of, of socializing this now. Um, we want to get feedback and input. Um, and uh, case in point, um, I've got the Parks and Rec a little bit later tonight. Uh, we shared it with the Trails Committee, the Planning Board. Um, I think the select board looks like we're on for March 1st and just trying to, to, to give people some visibility and, and see how they react. And the next steps for us are really, um, we want to, to establish a working group um, to prioritize some focus areas. And we're thinking of doing that sometime this spring. Um, from that point, we'll have some specific recommendations um, of which we then hold a public input session to, to further get some, some reaction on, on where we might do that. Um, and then that would all feed into our pedestrian connectivity plan and, and, and hopefully some proposals for uh, investment at annual town meeting uh, in 2023. So I realized I went through a lot there um, and I, I know there's some questions and, um, but just uh, to help, help keep things a little bit efficient, I appreciate everyone holding off. And um, so I guess um, through the chair, I will um, happy to entertain any, any questions that, that you folks have. Okay, great. That's a lot of data, Gary, and uh, very well done. I get, I'll open it up to our committee members first um, and ask if they have any questions for Gary or comments. I'm looking for- um, I have a very simple one. Yeah. <laughs> what is single track? Um, single track is, um, it's a, a narrow, largely natural, trail. Um, so it's often used for mountain bikers and it just means that it's uh, it's one bike width wide. All right. Thank so you. if you think of just as some examples, if you think of the, the center trail is what we would what we would define as a as a gravel cart path. And I know that some people would prefer that to be a called stone dust. Um, 
but then some of the trails that feed off of the center trail, um, some of those would be considered, we would consider a uh, single track. Got it. Um, I, I have a comment. Sure, Eric, go ahead. I think that what Gary and the planning board have done with this survey is not only great, but it's sort of historic. I mean, that the, uh, the entire thrust of it and the sophistication is something I've been in this town for 35 years and I've never seen anything in a survey that approaches uh, this kind of integrity. And I just want to offer my congratulations to Gary and the people involved. I agree okay. with you, Eric. Thank you. Um, anyone else from our, the, uh, uh, yes, Jane, Eli. Uh, Gary, did you inquire um, about the use of the trails in the adjacent towns like Holliston and, and Milford? Because I know many of my friends use those trails. Yeah, we, we did not as part of the survey. I think the only thing we asked is we asked how Hopkinton's pedestrian connectivity compares to, to neighboring towns, but we didn't get into any specific um, comparison. Okay, thank you. Um, any other committee members with questions, please use the raise hand function or wave or make yourself known somehow. Sin. Cynthia Estimer. Um, very good survey. Hard to do, hard to hit all kinds of points. Gary, your, your wildest guess, what was the range of ages that responded to this, like age five to 95? Any idea whatsoever what ages responded? It's a great question. Um, it would be a wild guess. Um, I'm trying to think of um, things I might have to, to make a more educated guess. Um, and I would say that 44% of our respondents um, have people in their family that they would like to walk to school. So, you yeah. know, I'd say it's probably safe to say that um, maybe two thirds of them are people that have school aged children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do know that um, the various, uh, the Trails Club um, and some of the other Trails folks, I think we're very good about uh, advocating and encouraging people to complete this survey. So I, I believe there's there's probably some slight bias towards the, the, the trail users and the runners. We asked to circulate it through the Runners Club and a bunch of other means. So I think there's a little bit of bias there. Um, but, you know, if I had to guess, I'd say probably call it two thirds or probably between the ages of 35 and 50. And, and there's probably, uh, you know, some range that are a little bit younger than that and, and some that are uh, a little bit older. That'd be my wildest guess. Thank you. That's all I was asking for. Thank you. Uh, yes, Bob. Are you mu muted, uh, Bob? I can't hear you. Yes. Uh, Likewise, Gary, this was a great um, pro uh, project uh, survey that you did. Thank you for doing it. Um, so what are the implications to the Upper Charles Trails Committee of this survey in your mind? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, and, and I will say that um, it's funny, you know, we we... Timing wise, we were a little bit late in rolling this out. Um, I wish we had done it earlier. Um, it's something we had talked about doing a year ago. And I think that with, with all the pandemic challenges, we didn't prioritize it. So I, I think that Upper Charles Trails Committee was definitely on people's minds um, as, or Upper Charles Trail, I should say, is definitely on people's minds um, as, as they completed it. Um, you know, to, to me, um, you know, if we look at this, we see a couple of things. And I think one, um, you know, there's uh, there's certainly a, a, a desire for, for pavement. Uh, and I know that's not popular with a lot of people, but um, 
you know, if you look at the the broader subset of respondents, well, you know that that there's uh, there is people like pavement, oh. um, and I know people will argue that well, 96% of the respondents uh, would use this for recreational purposes, running and walking, and um, those people also all um, like um, non-pavement as well, but collectively, um, pavement is popular. Uh, the second piece of it to me is, is that um, in general, um, particularly the recreational users um, really like to be a, away from the road. So, um, you know, I, 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 I'm going to be careful. And I, I, again, I, I realize that that's a great question. Uh, I think that's probably one that's better discussion for the Upper Charles Trails Committee than myself. But if I were just to lean into the data a little bit, you know, those are a couple of themes that I see that, that might help provide some guidance um, for, for this committee. And thank you. Okay. Uh, Jane? Yes. Hey, Barry. Barry. Uh, was there any mention, Gary, of um, any of the loops involving downtown? Or any um, other areas? Uh, potentially where the Upper Charles Trail is headed. Uh, it just seems to be general commentary. So I'm asking, is there any specific, uh, yeah. so, any specific so areas? We intentionally avoided asking the question of where should we put a sidewalk or trail? And, and we did that because it really, that point becomes a popularity contest. And you know, the, the neighborhood that submits the most votes is, is, is gonna win. And um, I, I will say that, um, you know, we, we did an open field response. We heard some things. Um, we certainly heard a lot of comments around, you know, don't run Upper Charles Trail along Hayden Row, um, which probably no surprise that to this group that, that some of that was heard. Um, we did get quite a few comments about um, a sidewalk needed um, on Cedar Street, really just beyond the post office going down the hill to those neighborhood, to those houses and in those neighborhoods. And um, I know there's been some conversation about, you know, linkage into the state park in some capacity, um, you know, and then we certainly heard prioritized sidewalks from the center of town. Um, we heard uh, EMC to, to Blueberry Lane, kind of a, a cut through in some capacity, which um, starts to get close to, I think, some of the proposed, one of the proposed options or your proposed option for the Upper Charles Trail. Um, so not a, not a ton, but we also didn't ask that specific question. Mm -hmm. Can I have a follow-up, Jane? Sure. Um, I guess we're, I couldn't see all the questions uh, or recall them all, but were there any um, financial or town budget oriented questions like um, where, would you, where would you invest in, in what you like, where would you want it, you know, and how much are you willing to spend or anything like that? Yeah, that, that, Barry, that's a great question. Um, we did not, and I think that's one of the limitations of this. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it's a hard question to ask. We've tried to ask it in, in previous surveys and without getting into some more sophisticated methodologies, it, it just is, you know, conjoint analysis and those kinds of things. It, it's hard to do that. Um, but I think your point is a great one. And, you know, again, as an example, if people say they prefer pavement, but would they rather have, uh, you know, five miles of, um, single track versus, uh, you know, a half mile of pavement, um, that, that could likely change the, the equation here. So I, I think that's, that's something that we didn't address here. Um, but also given the complexity of it, it's something that's hard to ask and interpret in a survey like this. And, that's where we think we're better served by taking this input and incorporating some of those considerations ourselves, coming forward with a recommendation and then going back to the public and getting some reaction and input to it. But that's, you know, again, it's, it's a survey. We can't do everything with it. Um, yeah, that's great. But it's, a, it's a great question. Great survey, thanks. I Harry, think I, I, has his hand up again. Uh, yeah, um, so I agree that it's, uh, a very useful thing to seek out this kind of data. Uh, I was a little baffled in filling out some of the questions, but I'm reassured by uh, the recommendations and next step part that's on the slide you're showing now, because that I think is 
uh, pretty much on the, on point. Uh, I'd like to point out though, when I was filling out the survey, I wasn't really sure that I was, that the Upper Charles Trail has much to do with it. I was thinking that instead it was a survey asking people how they would like to be able to uh, get around from their own house. And most people, regardless of where the Upper Charles Trail goes, are not going to be living that close to the Upper Charles Trail. Uh, unfortunately, just because the, the Upper Charles Trail is going to be pretty much, you know, uh, just one line and most people in Hopkinton are going to be living more than a half a mile away from that, wherever it is, I think. And so uh, I think it's hard to determine how uh, the results of this survey matter to the Upper Charles Trail. Another point is just from the pub, uh, standpoint of public safety, um, I think the most dangerous thing that people do, and we kind of already pointed this out, Gary, is, uh, is walk along roads where it's just dangerous from a visit, visibility standpoint. And I kind of think that there ought to be a priority in, in making it so that people don't get clobbered by cars. And that primarily has to do with, with walking along roads. Uh, but the Upper Charles Trail doesn't necessarily have to do with that. Jane, I, Jane? Yes. I agree, with, I agree with Ken. What we've looked at is two different uh, courses. One, what the Charles, uh, Upper Charles Trail is designed and commissioned to do. And two, what the people who don't want to walk in a straight line to get to another town want to do. That's why we have a trails committee. And the trails are in charge of hundred significant mileage of trails in town that provide and fulfill that desire by those people. I agree with Ken completely about this. Okay, so um, that's all good commentary. Does anyone else in the audience um, or the committee, does the committee, any of the committee members have a question or comment for Gary? We want to keep in mind that he has another meeting to go to. Okay, so does anyone from the general audience have a question for Gary? I'm looking for hands up. I do not see any. <clears throat> okay. Um, my screen just went blank. So I can't see anybody if they have hands up <clears throat> or not. We see you. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Jane, I think Ken still has his hand up. I don't know if that's intentional or oh. not, but that's the only one I see. Oh, it isn't. It isn't. I thought I closed it. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, there it is. It's gone now, Ken. Thank you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> all right. Anyone else have anything that they would like to share with or ask uh, Gary before he jumps off and goes to another meeting? No? Okay. Going once, going twice. Well, again, Gary, I can't thank you enough for coming and sharing your um, the readout with us. Uh, I think it's all valuable information. I know we're all going to be picking through this as time goes on, and we would be looking forward to further updates as we go along, too, as well. So thank you so very much. All right. Thanks for having me, and um, I look forward to the continued progress on this committee because it's, it's something that uh, is near and dear to my heart. So dear to your heart, yes. It is. <laughs> As it is with a lot of people in Hopkinton. So we're all on the same track page there. Thanks, Gary. Yep, thank you very much. Night. Thank you. You too. <clears throat> okay, so moving on to our next agenda item. Um, do we want to, I, I think we'll... Uh, put off the minutes till later. And I would like to go jump right into our re updates from the town engineer and our public e outreach process that we've, that he has so graciously started along with um, Matt from BHB. So Dave, it's all, it's in your court right now. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just wanted to give a, a, a quick update. Um, I've, I've started the general FAQ for um, 
the public outreach. I'll just try to share my screen um, to find it. You're not winning. Uh, okay. You don't need your agenda. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, ay, ay, ay. Stop, share. I don't know why it won't pull it up for me, but um, there's one more time. It will not pull. It will not pull up my my tab. So I apologize. I don't know why that's not working. Can you send it over to Elaine? Maybe she can pull it up. Yeah. Either that or just take us through it. Yeah. Um, I apologize. <laughs> it's always always game day where things get screwed up. Um, so currently it's it's you know um, it's a frequently asked question. It, it, there's an introduction first kind of a, of the you know the trail committee, what your charge is. Um, a real brief kind of half a page summary the, the, the there's FAQs um, for the most questions that have been answered um, asked provide answers to you know the proposed crossings of Hayden Row um, there's a question and an answer for a proposed alignment along Hayden Row mm -hmm. uh, there's a Q&A for the trail within the Irvin Tadaro properties um, a question about the um, other alignments, the Trails Club alignment that was proposed um, and presented to the committee by Mr. Legoy, um, and and more of a you know a construction a cost kind of question. Um, currently, it's about a five-page document. You know, it would be ready um, to present to the public. I, I just I it reads better and it provides more information. Um, linking to the project um, project uh, web page that, that's going to be under that we're developing under the window of the, the Hopkinton's main website. Um, within, I believe within a week, we should be able to have a, a kind of a live um, web page for this project specifically that we can post, you know, the relevant information. There'll be a place for folks to sign up um, for an email list, uh, it'll have um, the most relevant information um, that that your committee has presented. All the memos, all the studies. Um, it'll you know, folks can pull up the Conway reports that kind of show you know all the different alignments that your folks have gone through, um, and kind of create a timeline of all those different. Um, different studies, different areas, different outcomes. Um, so when developing the FAQ, the responses, I'll link, I'll have a link to the website and, and direct them to click on this folder or that folder to bring up the relative document that that, that um, question really um, is asking about. Um, it's, it's just taking, it's taking a long time. It's, it's not a typical FAQ where, where I can say, you know, somebody asks, what's the width of a standard travel lane? You can say 11 feet. Um, every, every one of these answers is like almost a page long. So <laughs> it takes a while. Uh, and, and then, so it's, it's done. I just need to fill in the website links and we need to backfill some of the folders that we're going to have on that website. Um, I talked to IT today. Um, I talked to Michelle uh, Murdoch today. Um, and, and that coordination will be able to quickly um, get that website up up and running. Um, once we get that in, I'm going to work on a kind of a project fact sheet. It's a little different, um, as well as uh, another kind of um, responses to to other public outreach questions, which which will be a um, those are the easier questions. They they haven't been asked as many times by as many people. But we want to get a response out to to everybody who emailed, you know, um, a dozen questions that don't that didn't match any of the uh, frequently asked questions or you know kind of kind of some of the offshoot questions. Um, 
So, so we'll be able to answer all of them um, and, and have that web page up. It'll it'll allow us to you know send out um, information updates the committee would like to submit, similar to a press release that goes out to the town. It'll it'll use all the uh, social media. Um, outlets the town uses on the website, and it'll also allow us to set up a, an individual specific email list that people can sign up for that you folks can, you know, in particular send um, information out just to them if, if it's something in particular um, to the people who, who sign up directly to receive information. Um, I will, I, I did share um, this draft with Jane just this morning, just, just to give, let her have a, a review of it. And um, hopefully, like I said, we'll have it up um, and ready to send out to everybody um, within the week. And yes, I, I did re get a chance to review it, Dave, and I'm really um, impressed with the overall quality of it. And just to reiterate what you had just said, you've been able to capture a majority of the concerns and comments general people had and broke it down into segments based on a factual information that you that we have collected over the years from working with our project. So this is this is a wonderful informational um, guide for people that they'll be able to use. And you make it quite clear that um, the second step will be uh, to answer more finite questions that people have that wasn't incorporated in the general um, introduction. And um, I look forward to being able to share this with the committee and with the public very shortly. So I think it's a great step. It's really progressive. It's a lot of people are interested in getting this uh, fact-based information sheet and um, it's really exciting going forward. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> And the, uh, the follow-up one will go much quicker because th those questions yeah. are a little more easier to answer. Yeah, I can, I can understand how that would be. You took a lot of time in the um, four or five pages that introduced the subject matter, and I can see how that would be. That's um, I, I really look forward to being able to share that with the public. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we had a couple of other things that we had posted on our agenda item that I think we wanted to touch on. And that was the two maps comparing 2016. And we had asked VHB a while ago to update it because there was so much conversation about a bridge. Um, and those were po both posted on our agenda and they're out there. So um, would you or Matt or both of you be willing to address that at this time? Um, address it from the standpoint, I, I there was original 2016, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, analysis that, that the committee had asked VHB to, to review, um, a flyover, not, a, a, not an at grade crossing, but a flyover of Hayden Row, um, to cross, um, uh, without impacting traffic. The, the first, the 2016 one was more or less, um, focused um, in coordination with the purchase of the Wyckoff property, I believe, which is now Echo Trail. And it, it was an attempt to, you know, if the town was to buy the Wyckoff, how could we connect the Wyckoff somehow to a flyover to get across to the other side? Um, and, and so the 2016 really was a draft. I think when they presented it to the committee as a draft, um, you know, uh, the feedback, um, the and again, Please correct me. I wasn't. I wasn't here. <laughs> I wasn't involved with the project then. But from what I understand, talking to you, Jane, and, and some input from others, um, you know, the committee, you know, just didn't want to pursue that uh, the flyover option. It it impacted uh, private property. Um, the cost was seen to be, you know, um, too high. Um, and even from an aesthetic value, you, you might not have been something that was popular with the committee then. Um, so it was kind of, um, not completed. The committee didn't, uh, have VHB do any further analysis on that to dig deeper into it. Cause the initial, you know, the initial costs and some of the items I just reviewed 
wasn't something the committee wanted to pursue then. Um, after the presentation um, by the Trails Club by uh, Mr. Legoy on the 19th of, of January, there were questions that, that the committee was asking, there was questions that the public was asking um, that nobody had questions to um, because that presentation, you know, had a, a little different twist on where that flyover might go. We go a little closer towards Milford. It'll be partially in Milford. It could possibly be totally in Milford. Um, so I had asked VHB on, on my own, um, not through the committee, to revise that 2016 memo um, and focus as well on some of the, um, the areas of the flyover might be located um, per, per the Trails Club um, alignment that Peter presented. Uh, and that's kind of the updated information in, in the 2022. Um, we presented both because the original 2016 memo had, had a lot of other information in it that wasn't really focused on a flyover. So I had asked VHB to, you know, remove stuff that wasn't, you know, relevant to a flyover, but, but we had them note that on the first page so that people would know what, what's the difference between the 16 and the 22 memo. Cause yeah. you read them, they read differently. Cause we removed a lot of different information. Right. There was information in the 2016 about there's different types of trails, this type of trail, that type of trail. Um, that wasn't relevant to what I asked VHP to do. Um, so that they updated that, that memo, you know, on my, my behalf, uh, I just, so, you know, we'd be able to answer some, some of the basic questions you folks were, were asking. Um, sure. And so, you know, mm-hmm. that's kind of, is that pretty much in line, Matt? <laughs> to to, to kind of, what we're really looking for is, you know, impact to private property, impact the property in Milford and Hopkinton. And, and kind of, I asked them to, you know, do some research on what they thought a flyover would look like compared to other flyovers in Massachusetts that have been built. So, Mm-hmm. Um, and to kind of give an estimate of what the cost might be and what other requirements would be to, to, to actually implement something like that. And, and Dave, I think <clears throat> there were two houses that were recently constructed down there. So I think that changed the alignment a little bit from the 2016 yep. original okay. alignment. So this <laughs> altered that just a little bit and, and okay. talked a little bit about what uh, might be some of the challenges from a, a design or permitting perspective. And uh, okay. yeah. Yeah, that was, again, thank you. That that was a, the, the change between the study done in 16 and the study done in 2022. There's two new houses that were built between um, kind of where the Echo Trail ends. Um, and, you know, if you cut through a property that the, the, um, the town is looking to purchase at annual, I'm not sure the town, um, I think the Trails Club, Again, if I'm wrong, I apologize to anybody. Um, there's a warrant, uh, an article of the town meeting this this year for purchasing a piece of property, I think at the end of Echo Trail, um, that would exit out to Hayden Row. Um, and between that property and the Milford line, there, there has been since 2016, kind of two new houses that were built. So um, those weren't taken into consideration in the 2016 memo. So I had asked VHB to, to, to just make sure that change was noted. Um, do any of the committee members have any comments or questions for Dave or Matt? Barry? Barry, you're muted. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, so I went through it again. It's uh, got, a, got a bit more on there. And um, if you set a bridge down there, let's say uh, the Trails Club routing could take place to, to 85 um, with the acquisition of that parcel now. Um, you, you're quoting like between a million to two million for bridge construction. That's, that's quite a, uh, a range, but there's a list of things above that, above the paragraph. I, I think that, what, what's missing in that number? I mean, what would be incremental, Matt, um, in reality, let's say we had 
um, ability to get some land on, on the uh, easterly side of 85. Um, and, yeah, and I, uh, uh, what, what's missing in the, in the one to $2 million range? I would first preface, you know, I, I didn't ask VHB to do a, a detailed cost estimate for how much it would cost to build them. No, just what functions, uh, what functions I should have said the, it as, or what categories would be mm -hmm. incremental without putting a dollar amount on it. What, it seems as though uh, there might be some things listed on there, but I'm not sure. This is a partial list. Yeah, yeah you know, I can, I can okay. add a few details if you want. Um, <clears throat> so to, to get from Echo Trail to the south and through that parcel, you have to come through the northerly side of uh, uh, 292 Hayden Row, which is where the two new houses were built. So I think it's that parcel that's up for town meeting that would be purchased right. and there's a wetland that goes through it. So right. some of those things that are listed in that cost estimate above that um, focus on things like, uh, you know, uh, boardwalks or other small bridges that might be needed to cross those wetlands or to run adjacent to the wetlands and then actually ramp up and get over Hayden Row. So um, it's hard to put a, an exact number on that without doing yeah, further no, survey or research. Um, no, no, I think, um, I think the TCMC is having some, some evaluation done. I, I'm not sure if that's, uh, yeah, you know, so that is, but maybe Peter could talk to that. But this is this this also includes uh, excludes any uh, additional land acquisition on the easterly side, right? Correct. This doesn't <clears throat> doesn't include any acquisition whatsoever. It just it, it looks at the alignment from the end of Echo Trail and gives some high level costs for crossing wetlands to get to a position uh, that you could ramp up and get over Hayden Row, and then what the cost might be for Hayden Row, including the the ramped up sections to raise up to get to a, a 17 foot, you know, and can I elevation. have one more follow up? Sure. Uh, yeah. So there's no, there's no conclusion that there's room to do it yet. This is just what if you could uh, find the room or the, the width of the roadway? Uh, yeah, it falls out. It, it, most of it would fall outside the, the, uh, the roadway layout. What does that mean? I, I think the answer to quick you could fit you could fit just about anything out there, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just a matter of land acquisition. Um, Correct. Yeah, you'd have to just take more land, um, or or get more easement space. You know, you can build almost anything anywhere. Um, it's just you know this is just more more meant to you know to answer the first questions that that were being asked is you know where would it go, um, and you know topography plays a part in some of that. Um, and there is, you know, some ledge outcroppings um, that, you know, reduce the the ramp up, ramp down uh, requirements on one side of the road. But again, we're talking going through private property. There'd be, you know, possible land acquisition costs. We, nobody knows how much, much that would cost. Um, Matt, was was this was this config, considering the H twenty? I, I forget we we talked about that, but the, this type of the flyover um, we included in this. And that's a, the loading is, um, you know, um, so an ambulance could could cross over it um, for public safety needs. There's a much difference, much bigger difference, obviously, um, if we're just talking a pedestrian kind of bike um, flyover uh, compared to one where you know um, you might have to design it um, for an ambulance crossing. Yeah, this would this would probably be. Uh, not an H20, but maybe somewhere around an H, H10 or, or so. Um, so that's a lesser tonnage. Okay. Um, so it's not, it's not a full, full design with, to where almost any vehicle could cross. Correct. Correct. Um, but it's, correct. Yeah. it's enough yeah. where you might. Um, so you would have to find access points along, you know, a Hayden Row for emergency vehicle to drive up, you know, maybe drive up the ramps, but not over the bridge from either side. So there's a lot of different work that needs to go into this when this probably doesn't include any utility costs it probably doesn't include any um mm -hmm. you know uh roadway work on on 85 itself it's just kind of real basic thirty thousand foot kind of look that you know it's going to cost everybody knows it costs a lot of money to, to do something like this um and depending on where the funds come from would would um you know determine what design standard you, you need to meet. Um, 
Uh-huh. Maybe if it comes from the state or federal mass DOT bridge design standards are going to have to be met. So um, as we all know, that would drastically increase a, a project if, you know, just the town paid for it in when it was just going to be designed for, you know, pedestrian bikes loop crossing, but um, to meet some public safety recommendations, um, they'd want access points on both sides for emergency vehicles to be able to get up to the bridge, um, but not over it. Even on the boardwalk? Um, if there's access points, yeah, yeah the public safety is, is recommended um, any, any trail construction, <laughs> that's their, their desire is that you, you can get an ambulance there and you can get a pumper truck there because they, you know, if you have fires anywhere within the areas, they want to be able to get there. Um, so Dave, just a correction, the, um, I'm sorry, I think we, I think we changed, we changed our approach and we went with a prefabricated bridge for this, assuming okay. that, um, emergency access could access from either side of Hayden row because the okay. ramps were pretty close to the, uh, to the roadway. So there right. is a cost in there, which includes a, the prefabricated type bridge, but that includes the cost for abutments, uh, that okay. would go along with that. So. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, as it stands, it's, you know, this, this, the crossing wouldn't be, you know, designed to carry the weight of an ambulance, but, but the abutments would. <laughs> Interesting. I see Ken, does that answer all of your questions? Um, okay, so now Ken, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, so, you know, the bridge alternative didn't seem terribly attractive back when we didn't have a cost estimate for the other alternatives, but now we do. So we've got to weigh the costs that are uh, in that most recent plan to the cost of uh, segments starting from Granite Street all the way to the Milford parking lot. And I think the bridge turns out to be, uh, my, my thinking is it, it, it's going to be less expensive than that. So I don't see how this cost estimate uh, so yeah, it sounded like a lot of money, but is it a lot of money compared to the alternative? You've also got to consider that if you uh, like trails, which I do, uh, building a, a single track type trail uh, along the proposed UCTC corridor would not cost almost anything, given that the town could probably do that with volunteers. So uh, the, I, I would say that the additional connectivity to be gained by having uh, the trail going all the way uh, to the west side of the, I, I call it the Beaver Brook stream, uh, sorry, the east side of that. Uh, there is some gain in connectivity there, but any old trail could do that, including a single track, which uh, I would say uh, the trail committee and uh, the trails club could handle construction of that given no barrier to, uh, uh, to building it from property ownership consideration. So uh, I think what we got away is, 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 is the cost of the, the trail, the, the bridge versus the whole segment from Granite Street to the Milford parking lot. Well, that, that assumes you have uh, land on the east side, right? Yeah, so, so the cost of buying that land on the east and west sides in order to, to build the bridge needs to be accounted for, that's right. And it's incremental to this, uh, this number is just some basic construction. Yeah, and again, that's true. My my understanding so, and direction, you know, could from be a million from dollars to acquire the east side. I don't know, but you know, I, I disagree with any re reasonable requirement that an ambulance needs to go up the abutments. I mean, uh, an ambulance can can come to uh, the Milford parking lot and it can come to the driveways that that are going to be on the north side of the bridge, and there's really no serious need for an ambulance to go any further than that. Well, I, I'm I just, understand how that, that's I'm just, um, I'm just relaying the message from your fire chief. <laughs> if you want to invite him to come to one of your meetings and, and discuss, you know, his operations and what he would, what he would want. I, I, I welcome, I welcome the opportunity to, to invite him for you. Uh, again, so I'm not, I'm just, I asked Ken, I just simply asked him if the town was to build a trail, um, you know, you know so, so what, would he, fire, what would their requirements be? Hmm? Right. You know, a fire truck could sit on Hayden on 85 and spray any part of that abutment. 
easily without having to go up the ramp. Yeah, it's I'm not. Up. I'm not a fireman, and I'm not the fire chief, so I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't entertain this. You know, sorry. I just. I've learned. Um, I don't know anything about fire operations, based on you know my 10, 12 years having discussions with the emergency management group. Um, they have all sorts of types of vehicles and, um, oh. you know, it would be a, a discussion to have with, with the fire chief. I, I, I had no idea a discussion might go in this direction. I would have invited the fire chief. Um, right. Um, but again, I think, you know, based on, you know, my discussions, you know, with, with the committee to date and, and, you know, explaining to me what the charge is, you know, you folks are charged with, with kind of building a, a, a multi-user active passive trail system um, for everyone to use. Um, and I think the town really, you know, supports that kind of initiative, um, you know, not wanting to exclude any, any user from using the trail. So if you can, if I could just jump in here a little bit. Um, yeah. It goes back to what we were speaking to at our last meeting when we were trying to speak to the differences between the multi-use um, Upper Charles Trail that we've been charged with building, designing and planning and engineering to um, which would be a spine trail uh, as incorporating spur trails, which I think that you just mentioned would be of great value. Um, with the single use path to get to this bridge. If, if the townsfolk wanna to go along and pay for the cost of this bridge, it could be that uh, we could have both. You could have your single use path up to the bridge and um, then the Upper Charles Trail can figure out where they need to go to satisfy all the needs of a multi-use path that would accommodate all various types of users um, with a different type of a trail. Um, anyway, so oh, does yeah, anyone I mean, else I, have I any other comments? Hmm? I'm sorry, I, what? I, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, whichever is the cheaper alternative. If it's indeed cheaper to build the UCTC trail uh, all the way as proposed by UCTC, I, I'd say that's the way to go. I'm, I'm dubious if that's the case, but possibly it is. I don't think that the UCTC See, Upper Charles Trail Committee is um, focused on single use path. I think it's quite the opposite. The UC Upper Charles Trail Committee is focused on a multi use path, which, which can accommodate all sorts of folks. Uh, the TCMC, right. which is the Trails Coordination and Management Committee, has a very different function. And I think that's where um, th that conversation of a single use path needs to go. And as they know, they've got single use paths all over the town and more are welcome and people love them. And I think there's room for everything in this conversation. Um, I see Barry has his hand up. Again, sorry, Jane. Um, you know, I reread, you know, I got a copy of the uh, charge for the committee, right? Our committee? Yeah, the two, February 2017 revised mm -hmm. select board charge. And right. I'll tell you what's been rolling around is embracing two to three options is the charge mm -hmm. to, br to bring to the select board to have the town select board um, make a decision. Correct. So I don't see why the, you know there can't be multiple two to three options and one of them could be partially a single use. That wouldn't be an Upper Charles Trail proposal. Um, if the TCMC wanted to go through there and propose that, that would be different. Our charge is to propose two or three different paths of the quality of the type of trail that we have been charged with building. So the, does that mean the, the echo section is not wide enough to contain? A, no, it's, uh, I think it's wide enough. We're just struggling with how to get over to the um, um, 85 east side where the Milford parking lot is. Well, let's assume something could be designed for that and that could be um, embraced as an option. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And that's this whole purpose of all of these conversations is to continue to incorporate everybody's ideas, but keeping in focus what our charge is. We have a charge of a multi-use path. I think there's plenty of room for single use paths. That's just not our charge. That's the trails coordination and management. That would be under their auspices. We're our charge is completely different. When we finish with our project, which is this uh, class five system from Milford to Hopkinton, the select board will dissolve us. We're gone away. But the TCMC will be there forever, building and maintaining and constructing all types of trails. And um, that just leaves me to one other question that I had for the engineers. And supposedly, we, if we could get a grant to pay for the, um, this flyover section, I just want to, you touched on it, Dave, but I just want to make it clear. The grant would cover for the cost of the bridge and the ramps, correct? If we were so lucky to be able to meet all of the criteria. But, uh, however, you know, if, if like a, like say like a tip project. Yeah. Like a state grant, yeah, a tip funded project would would pay for all the construction costs. So they wouldn't. I don't think they'd pay for um, land acquisition. Correct. Um, they That's wouldn't pay for the design. It into. Right. Um, they wouldn't pay for say cost of you um, um, moving the utilities, whatever they might be, electric water. I think we went through this with the downtown Carter. And wasn't uh, that one of the big concerns with the townspeople that we had to, the townspeople had to pick up that cost because it wouldn't be uh, in the DOT. Yeah, it, it all depends on kind of where it crosses, Jane. Um, if there are overhead utilities that are there and they need to be moved or something, I, I believe the state covers a portion of that. Okay. And Matt, you could you can chime in anytime and correct me. Well, um helpful. I think yeah, water and sewer utilities, the town would be responsible for, but you know, if there's drainage improvements, um, the grant would, the, the, the funding would cover that. The state funding would cover that. So yeah, if, you, if you pursued something on the tip for, for this, it would and it's, be- It's years yeah. and years and years and years away is, is the other thing. Right. And, and plus yeah. they may require you to, to design it to their standards again, which which may require, you know, it is whatever it is, it becomes their, their nickel. And however they want to over-design it um, and over-build it, it becomes be up to nice. them. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a decade, two decades away. Because <laughs> okay. you get the Main Street Corridor projects being built now, and the first first um, form yeah. submitted submitted to the state was in 1999. So um, Got it. it's 20 years down the road. Again, a project, I, I say in general, you know, certain projects that were within the, the sweet spot of, you know, two to two to four million dollars or something along those lines, maybe, you know, six million dollars the most. So many those, those are easy to, you know, as the larger projects get moved around on their, their schedule, um, holes open up every year and they look for these, you know, small projects to fill those holes. But it, it's Again, the, the design process would be easily six to eight years away. Okay. And Dave, so, and Dave just, I mean, just on that, from a perspective yeah. of bringing a TIP project forward, and it's a topic we've had before, it's, it's the whole wetland impacts, right? You have to make sure you stay under that 5,000 square right. foot wetland impacts. If you can't stay under the 5,000 square feet, you don't have a project. So you have to have, right. a, you have, to have a, an access at the, at the beginning of the, of the project and at the end in order for it to be a project and to be an independent utility. If you don't, if you, if you can create that project and stay under 5,000 square feet, then you have a project and going this route from echo trail through that area where the wetland is and going up and over it's, that's something that needs to be determined because you have to ramp up to get over Hayden row and you need about 350 feet at a 5% grade to get over Hayden row. Right. And you have to find where those wetlands are in that wooded area that's down beyond those homes. And that's, that's the challenging piece, especially that parcel that's up for purchase through town meeting that I think 70% of it is wetlands, so. It is. 
Okay, so again, I think Peter has his hand up. Peter? I, hi, Jane. Um, just a couple points of clarification. Um, the, 200, the 2016 report was done um, after those houses were built. Those houses were built in 2013. Oh. And if you recall, I was on, I was a member of a subcommittee actually to the Upper Charles Trail Committee where we were looking at the options for going across there. Um, you know, there were, there were several options we looked at. The VHB then looked at that flyover, but they looked at it in the, in the essentially the wrong location at that time. And that's where that $2 million estimate came from. Um, I had provided an estimate for a bridge only, which was $50,000, I think, but we knew that a lot more um, needed to go with that. The cost of the bridge was a small piece of the overall costs. Um, this is actually, I think, quite useful. One of the things it does show is if you look at the first two cost items, um, they average, they sum to $465,000, and that's the bridge-related cost. So that matches up pretty well with what I was saying, which is basically, I figured it'd be about a half million dollars. Um, to Ken's point, um, the cost of Echo Trail, which already exists, plus the you know 1.1 to $2 million um, that would it take to get the Echo Trail over bridge route, I think does compare pretty favorably and is, is in fact cheaper than crossing Hayden Row, going down College Street, going through the College Rock Woods. And I think one thing that is not considered in VHB's current thinking is if you watched your flyover from the December 8th meeting, that went through what was primarily a green wooded area with the exception of your flyover, which was through a red tinged area that was in September what that red tinged area was was obviously a wetland and it's a fairly extensive wetland in there in College Rock there's also now through beaver activity about 130 feet of pond that you have to get over on that side to get even close to the Milford Trail plus in order to avoid um, Mr. Proctor's land, you have to go through a pretty extensive hunk of ledge that's sort of right in the way um, at this point. So, you know, I think the details on the ground haven't been done on either side in a, to a full degree. But at this point, yes, you need some easements on that west side, but boy, it certainly looks like it's it's at least in the range and in all likelihood cheaper than the other option. Um, to Barry's point with regard to the west side, that connects to Milford um, Conservation Commission land, the same land owner who owns the Milford bike trail. So we don't see that being an issue. Um, to one of Dave's points, while I have not talked to the fire chief, this current fire chief, I have talked to the previous two fire chiefs with regard to bridges on trails previously, the center trail. And these, I would add, are not single use trails. These are multi-use trails that we're talking about. And in those cases, um, I was told that the fire department does have a gator and that's what they would see being used for something like this. They, they did not see a need to have an ambulance going over these bridges. Obviously, early days, we haven't talked to Milford, but I would see this being more a pedestrian type trail. Um, one final point to Matt, um, yes, that is 70% wood wetland, but Elaine and our previous um, conservation agent Don McAdam did walk down there. There's a upland piece that runs along the eastern edge of that right out to the road. So you can, you, you may need to do some boardwalk work along 85, but in the woods itself, you're actually fine. Um, so um, that's all, but um, yeah, that's all. Well, thank you, Peter. That's all good information. Um, Dave? 
Oh, you're muted, Dave. Sorry about that. How many times is that going to have to happen before? Um, I just want to thank Peter for the correction. I, I'm trying to catch up on the history of everything, and it's nearly impossible. I wasn't aware those new houses were built um, prior to the 2016 report. Um, that, that's all. And, and again, I, I welcome, uh, I, I will ask the fire chief to, to attend a meeting to discuss what, what his recommendations slash requirements might be, um, if, if it'll help close out that question. Yeah, that might be useful going down the road. Because I, I'm not the person to speak about fire operations. No, I don't think any of us want to do that. Sorry. That's your own specialty. Um, um, okay. Uh, one more comment from Ken, and then we're going to move on to the next agenda item. Yeah, I, I, this is pretty much been stated already, but I think that the wetlands crossing going from the Echo to the Milford parking lot are very small compared to the UCTC route which would require uh, something we haven't talked about much, but it would have to cross that Beaver Brook stream, which is a fairly big stream twice with bridges, either at or go on College Street to get across once. And those would those would be substantial amounts. In addition to the wetlands that Peter pointed out, there's also wetlands on the north side of College Street uh, that are fairly substantial and likely to flood at least some of the time. So it's uh, you're talking a lot of boardwalk for the UCTC route. We're talking a rather small amount for the uh, southern end of Echo to the Milford parking lot route. Some of it at the bridge abutment area, and there's a tiny amount, I would say, a relatively tiny amount between the southern terminus of Echo to Hayden Row. You can't over, if you can't cross that amount of wetland between that, the southern end of Echo and, uh, and Hayden Row, I'd say the whole UCTC route is doomed because there are many other more serious wetland crossings that have to be uh, dealt with than that, particularly between Hughes and Granite Street. There, there you're talking much more wetlands, I mean, by an order of magnitude, I, I would estimate. Hughes and Granite, well, whichever um, and every, trail grabs a piece of that, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a problematic for either TCMC yeah. or Upper Trails Trail. So I think that we'll continue right. to discuss this and investigate this and do our due diligence. But this, I think, has been a very healthy conversation. We'll take in all of this data and continue to um, uh, you know, promote our, our plan. So the next item on the agenda is for Dave, an update on the new, the town property acquired that abuts the EMC Park and the east side of the Irvine Tadaro property. Uh, you mentioned that you may have an update. I'm not sure if it's ready or not. Um, unfortunately, uh, I it, it wasn't ready, Jane. <laughs> okay, that's no problem. We we'll put it on a, a follow up agenda sometime down yeah. the road. It, it, it's a piece of property that you know um, will come will come to the town. Uh, it just has to be accepted at town meeting. Um, yeah. uh, very good. I think it's just important that we just keep. Um, trying to keep track of all these moving yeah. pieces. Yeah, as things things do change, so it, it's They it's sure do. They good sure to do. try to keep track of the changes. Yeah. So moving on to number 5, discussion on next steps. And before I go into um, the look at uh, seven segments 7 through 11, I just want to do a very brief update and remind um, all of our committee members and the general public that um, we have done our due diligence from the very beginning, looking at a west side approach. Uh, back, it goes all the way back to 2014, 15, 16. We have continuously looked at all different avenues. Um, we wrote a CPC application for the Wyckoff property, and it's now known as Echo Trail, but that was on our initiative because we saw this as a distinct possibility it's always been our thought and our hope that we would be able to take the trail down the west side of Hayden Row. Um, we sought the select board to um, 
And then we say we sought them to select the name change for the property to Echo Trail. Uh, we secured an easement behind the properties of these two new houses that you're talking about, uh, 292 and 294. We actually went so far as to get easements from those property owners, uh, the developer at the time, to bring our trail off of Echo Trail in back of 292 and 294 out to Hayden Row, crossing those driveways. And we had we hit a dead end. The, the property owners further to the south did not want to communicate with us or have any other conversations about us going over their property. Um, then uh, we had VHB do the study of the bridge that we just uh, crossing that we just reviewed um, both in 216 and now more currently. So we are constantly looking at these. Uh, we ran into uh, obstacles with land procurements right away on the, on the um, west side of Hayden Row. Uh, we went so far as to ask VHB to conduct a traffic survey that went all the way from Milford parking lot all the way down to EMC parking lot to show us where the safest places were to, to cross. They determined that it was not safe to cross anywhere between the Milford parking lot and College Street. That's when the conversation about a flyover came up and we, we, we followed that path to see what we could eke out to see if that was a possibility. Um, so, you know, we have, we have looked at all these multiple options over and over again. We continue to have meetings and discussions. Uh, one thing we've not been able to be, we've not been able to successfully engage either the town of Milford or the town of Holliston in any of our conversations. So we saying, well, we keep saying, well, that's off for a different day. We can't do that right now. Uh, we've successfully uh, uh, procured um, easement agreements with the Milford Water Company to have our trail come through um, on the south side of Granite Street on their property. They're very, very willing to um, meet and continue discussions with us along those avenues. So we have really, I think, done our due diligence seeking out in eking out every possibility along the west side. Um, we received when we went public with the idea after some pressure to go through and what was the temperature of the Charles View neighborhood and what was their feelings for having a trail go through their neighborhood. We received um, a publicated uh, letter with, um, oh, I've forgotten the number of signatures, but it was over 50 of um, the Charles View residents that said, no, they were not interested in having a trail that in the magnitude of the Upper Charles Trail going through their neighborhood. And so from the very beginning, we've tried to reach out and um, can, uh, have a conversation with the neighborhoods and the neighbors that we could possibly be impacting. And we do listen to them. And I just wanna remind everybody that we continue to do that. So just recently, and Peter's on the line, and so is Ken Parker, and he's a liaison to the Upper Charles Trail, that um, Peter, as chair of the TCMC, requested up to $5,000, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, for engineering studies for, to continue a crossing for a bridge, um, engineering studies in that. And for that, I'm, I'm very grateful because he may be able to come up with new and different information that we have been not been able to identify at this point in time. So having said all of that, um, we wanna look, look to the segments seven through 11. And are you able to pull up what those might look like, Dave? So that our members can look and see what we're talking about. How is it? And I'm going to ask the members and the community. Um, how? What are our next steps? We want to think about how to continue along, looking at segments seven through eleven. Now we've changed them from phases to segments, 
So, and, and I believe that um, I've talked with Dave earlier this week that we're going to correct that on our website and bring it, make that up to date so that everybody knows what we're talking about when we refer to segments. But the segment seven that we will be uh, looking into, that's the subject of conversation along Route 85 with, with the crossings in mind. So that's, that's what we would be looking at. And how do we want, how do we want to guide BHB and our town engineers to help us determine if this is possible? Um, Jane, can you see the map? Yes, I can see it now. Thank okay. you. So I guess I throw this out to Dave and or Matt um, or committee members. Jane, can I can I um show one one graphic? There was a, a question that I was working on the right away for you know the segment sure. seven. Um, let me try to share. I can bring this back up, but I wanted to share kind of a sample. Uh, cross section. Can you see this? So yeah. the, the question to will, will a proposed shared youth path and a sidewalk on one side of the road fit within the right of way? Um, the answer would be yes, even if it was a 49.5 foot right of way. Uh -huh. um, you'd have buffers on both sides, grass strips that would separate the, the travel lanes from the sidewalk on one side and from the shared use path on the other. Um, but like everything in the world um, that we try to answer, the answer is also no, <laughs> because the existing center line of Hayden Row does not stay within the center line of the right of way. So as Hayden Row, you know, travels from EMC down to Granite Street, it gets closer to one side of the right of way and then kind of meanders back to the other side. So following the current curb line, of Hayden Row and trying to build a shared youth path on one side and in a sidewalk on the other with buffers kind of similar to this graphic that I'm showing, you would impact the, the private property kind of throughout the corridor on different sides. Um, so it would impact private property that way. Uh, thinking, you know, bigger picture, if, if the town would support a realignment of Hayden Row from EMC to Granite Street and rebuild Hayden Row with this type of um, cross section and as well as, you know, maybe take the opportunity to, to put in some traffic calming because the town has always been asking the town to slow down traffic on Hayden Row. Um, you know, this could be a much bigger project to, to kind of kill two birds with one stone if that was something, you know, that would move forward. So again, I, I hope it's not confusing. It, it was hard to kind of try to explain this, but, you know, big picture, if, you know, it would be a multi-million dollar project to realign Hayden Row, but you could fit it in there. Um, but you'd have to change the curb line so that, you know, the center line of the roadway follows the center line of the right of way there. Um, wouldn't be an easy project um, we've heard that, you know, even through, um, Gary's presentation, um, majority of people don't, don't, don't want bike trails next to Payton Row. They want them off the major roads. Um, how far off, I guess, <laughs> might be the question. <laughs> if you can have a five or six foot buffer between the road and, and, you know, the bike path or a shared use path, um, would people feel safer than, you know, where Hayden Row right now, you have a sidewalk that's connected to the curb line. So, you know, even when you're walking, you're, the cars go by, you're, you're within a couple of feet. So I, I just wanted to, I, I hope, because we couldn't find the, the 1905 county layout plans. So we just went with the smallest width that we did find, which was 49 and a half feet. You would be able to fit something in the right of way. You'd have to reconstruct the roadway you know, to fit that alignment in so it wouldn't impact private property. Um, it probably would impact old old growth trees that are there that are now in the right of way. Um, we have that problem every time you, you try to build something to the right of way property line. Um, you do impact what what people have been taking care of, you know, for, for decades as as their as their front lawns. So um, that was just my my 
my last kind of two cents to explain the right away question, um, you know, from EMC Park down to, to Granite Street. Okay, that's, um, that's helpful information that we have to know going forward with our discussions. Do the committee members have any comments or questions? Um, yes. Um, have you just said that uh, it's just not feasible to do the plan along Hayden Row that we've been talking about? No, no, I, I didn't. Um, I didn't say it wouldn't be feasible. It's possible, um, but it's a it's a larger project than just building a shared youth path on one side of Hayden Row, if that makes sense. It would be a roadway kind of realignment reconstruction project. Um, but, you know, kind of like going back earlier to, you know, you can build just about anything. Um, right. Just the cost goes up. Um, so it's not an easy yes or no question. You, you couldn't build it right now based on the current alignment of Hayden Row without impacting private property. But if you realigned Hayden Row um, within the existing right of way, you could probably uh, do it within a 49 and a half foot right of way. So if that makes sense, there's other, obviously there's other work that would be associated with that. It's his utility work. There's probably drainage work. There's, um, you know, you're reconstructing an entire roadway. Um, Dave, um, just a quick question. Would this be similar to the traffic coming measures they took in front of the school a few years ago on Hayden Row? Um, I, I, can't, I can't recall if they changed curb lines on that. That wasn't. Yeah, they did. They did. So, yeah, you'd be moving the curb. Right. Back and forth. They narrowed you know. it in some spots. In fact, I think right. they narrowed it a whole lot. Right. And, I mean, it's just a, a kind of an opportunity, like you said, for you know, the, the town, since I've been here, have been getting requests from the community to, to slow the traffic down on Hayden Row. So as I don't know, as, as part of a bigger picture type of project to, to deal with, I say deal with, to, to you know, um, do two kind of projects at once. The town undertook the cost of that traffic calming measurements in the vicinity of the schools. Yes. yes. Yeah. It was much, 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 much smaller. <laughs> No, I'm I mean, just I, curious, but just yeah. to give folks can have a general idea of what we're talking about. No. I see Barry has his hand up. Yeah, I don't want to take airtime here from the rest of the committee, but uh, so what I just, but what I heard is if I had two to three, I'm going back to this two to three options. I'm sorry, I'm a broken record. But um, if you were, if you were doing a case, of presenting uh, options for executive board to decide, this this just dropped down to third. If you're going to keep it in the in the pool at all, uh, because another factor here is time. How long? I mean, it's a not only a, a, sounds like a severe project, but uh, something that's that's years down the road. So. You know, if you had a couple of other options and, and time was shrunk or made more current, that would be a, a, a solid attribute to consider um, for options one and two, if, if you want to go along with what, what I keep going back to. Uh, but you could keep it, you could keep this proposal um, conceptual on the table as number three and just move on and, and, uh, and work on one or two others to get down to Milford. I don't want to get hung up on one route. I want to get the, I want to get it done. Well, I think we're all on the same page there. We've been trying to get it done for years. And then my brief summary, my introduction tonight is that we've exhausted the west side approach and the east. I mean, what's left? I think we're talking about 85 because I don't think that there's anything left. If you can come up with something, let me know. <laughs> well, I, I thought this, 
I'm, I'm still not sure, you know, maybe I'll have to look at the map clear. I thought coming off of uh, Echo Trail to the Metro West properties was a dead end, but I, I was just looking at the uh, Trails Club proposal. Maybe they go down south on 85 on that side of the road from Metro West for several hundred feet or more. And then, and then in Milford, build a bridge, not in, Ho not in Hopkinton. That's correct, from my understanding. So I, I, I misconstrued that. So I, uh, you know, now I understand that. Well, I mean, I think we should really- I mean, Peter's still, is Peter still out there? He could answer that. Peter, did- um, Yeah. Um, did uh, Barry get that correct? Coming much, out of the yeah. Metro West and you stay on the West side and until you get to the, in Milford where, you, where a proposed flyover could go. You Yeah, you basically take it down to the Hopkinton line um, and then the flyover starts just a little bit south of that in Milford over to the, um, into the East side, correct. Okay, okay, thanks. That answer your question, Barry? Yeah, I had one for Dave, maybe, or Matt. On, on, on bridge construction like this, uh, just a what if thought. Is it possible that this, if this was a state project, they could help mitigate any hesitancy on the town of Milford to build it? It doesn't become Hopkins yeah, the and state, Milford. Yeah, it the state, it's not a state road. It, it, it's not a state road, so uh, the, okay. the state wouldn't get involved. With, All right. With trying to bend anybody's arm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. And, and I was just, you know, on behalf of through, through Jane, um, I recommend folks, you know, take a look back at the Conway reports um, to, to get a, a reminder or maybe, uh, you know, I don't know the makeup of the committee, what, if it was the same or what, what new members are new and which one aren't. But it goes through all the different options, different routes. Mm -hmm. And there's three options shown, you know, um, that the committee looked at. Um, yeah. All through, all through the project from, from Main Street down to, down to, you know, the Milford line is where they really kind of were looking at. Um, and, and it's kind of very informative, you know, different roadblocks that they hit. And, and it's kind of why the, the trail is kind of proposed where it is now because um, of the different roadblocks that were hit. Um, but I just think it's an, it's, an, I was fascinated by, I found it just, just Monday um, and, and was glad I did because I, I, I'm going to be able to make it much more public so people can, you know, get a better understanding of kind of the, some of the history that you folks have, have gone through with all the different alignments you've looked at and all the different options. And um, cause it's three great. different. Routes, so We'll get that out as soon as we can. And yeah. then we have links. Yeah. Dave's talking about putting the links right in, embedding them right in the document so people can just click on it. Right. It'll bring you access. kind of right to those reports. And I appreciated Jane bringing us through some of the lead up history too. It's yeah. Still, We've done an awful we, lot. Yeah. Um, I see Ken has his hand up. Are you muted, Ken? Yeah. So, uh, just a comment about the western route i thought that that was still on the table you know we had encountered roadblocks there but you know just to take a a perspective here if we'd focused on going down hayden road in the first place we would have hit roadblocks there and if we used those roadblocks as an excuse to decide permanently that that was an unviable option then we would have been forced to to, to go west of charlesview if we hadn't considered that as carefully so it, it just doesn't make sense to me that uh because Right now, we know there are roadblocks in, in every place, and we have an estimate for the costs of going down Hayden Road. We have not such a good estimate now for the cost of going west of Charlesview. Now, uh, another thing I'd like to point out is that survey by Charlesview residents had to do with the trail going right through on existing Charlesview streets and did not address or distinguish between the possibility of a trail going through the woods, not that close to people's houses. Another thing to consider is that many of those people have been dismayed by uh, some of the solar farms that are over there. And, you know, that might weigh into how they think about how ugly a trail would be going behind their houses as opposed to the solar farm. So 
So uh, there's a lot of things that changed, and I just don't think that uh, the initial roadblocks for the Western route are good enough to say that that's not uh, a viable option, given what uh, uh, Dave just went through with regards to uh, how difficult it might actually be to, to build a multi-use path down Hayden Row as opposed to just playing the existing sidewalk. I think that's Jane. what we're looking at, Jane. though. Yeah. Jane. I hear somebody out there. Yeah, you hear Eric. Okay, I Eric. I can't raise my hand oh, no. <laughs> because you can't see me. But I can hear you. Go ahead. I've been on this committee for seven plus years. One of the first things I encountered was the Conley survey when I got there. Having been a professional my entire life, I thought it was very lacking. And when I reviewed it, I found out it was done by college students trying to get a grade. It was not well done. As I've listened to this whole discussion, it is, I can't, I'm not going past that. I just want to tell you that any reference to the Conley survey will get my complete disgrace. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to say that it was, it's Conway, it's not the Collins. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is what it is. It's part of our history and it's there and um, we can't take it away. Um, let's see. So I'm not sure if we got anywhere. We, we did look at segments uh, seven through 11. We've identified that that's probably where we ne need to go next. I'm not sure which way the committee wants to go at this point, but I'm, I, if they don't want to go down that route, what's the, what is the option? Give us time to think. What? Well, it it seems uh, through the chair. Yes, Barry. I don't know. I think the committee should come up with some options here. You're asking us to. I'll throw it out. I mean, we stop and see what, what can be done down there on the southern end. But there's a lot of work that would need to be, we'd have to put ourselves on deferral. Um, that going forward, if we want to keep moving forward, which is what we want to do, uh, we've exhausted going behind Chamberlain. We run into dead ends because private property owners don't want to give us easements through that. That's how we ended up on Route 85. Um, if you don't want to go down 85 what do you do? what do you want to do folks do you just want to throw up your hands and give it up after all of this work or do you want to pursue it and see do some more hard work and figure out how we're going to get there from here jane i don't think we can do this tonight i think we have to think about everything it said and do it at our next meeting anyone else have a thought we ought to ask the select board to decide between how, how we ought to proceed. If we can't give them a positive, if we can't give them choices, yeah. what what are they going to do if we can't come up with something? I think we need guidance from them as to what choices they might want to have us decide between. And well, I don't I, see, I, I, I think that the select board is better suited than we are for deciding whether we should continue looking at the west, west of Charles View route versus down Hayden Row, and also the uh, UCTC route that goes east of uh, down College Street versus the, the flyover bridge. Although I, I think that those are two separate problems and need not be tied together. They're, uh, the, the final solution could, could be any combination of those. There well, is not one member of the select board who has a clue what we've been doing. Sure, right. You would be making it into a political thing, whether as opposed to a fact-based uh, right. decision. That's what we're trying to come up with in the facts. And we don't want to make it political. Restricting the choices is making it even more political. <laughs> no, <laughs> come on, Kim. 
Um, all right, so that's, that's going by fiat without without allowing anybody to weigh in. I I, 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 I totally reject that that logic. Yeah, I, Jane through the chair. Yes, Barry. I mean, it, it seems to me uh, it, the next thing to do would be to find out from Peter if he's still on the line what the extent of the studies on the um, you know, is it both east and west on the crossover and what, whether it would involve the impact to property owners and their front yards. And, you know, it, it's pointing to um, the Metro West properties purchase and, um, and find out how much this study is going to unravel and wait and see what it unravels. Um, is Peter still out there? Are you willing to take that on, Peter? Um, yes. Yeah, so we still feel that there's a viable alternative for a multi-use path around Charles U, as I presented at your folks' meeting in January 19th. Um, so that's the piece that would um, be opposite your segments five, six, seven, and eight. And we also feel that that going down Echo Trail and crossing in front of those two new houses and then across some driveways is also still an option. I do think there is some easement issues there. Um, but I think to your um, to Dave's point, I don't think there's any way you can get here without a few easements. And that's not insurmountable. Um, these are not an area... Uh, Unlike the area along segment seven, which is people's front yards, these are areas that are essentially wooded property not currently being used. Obviously, the segments right in front of the two houses are front yards, but those are front yards that butt up against a essentially unprotected roadway. So in some regards, um, you know, some curbing some sort of buffer would be needed there in any case. Um, and you may be able to stay in the right of way based on, um, there used to be some stakes out there that showed where the right of way was. And I think you could narrow the path down to eight feet through that area to keep traffic slow. And if you do that, I think you can stay in the right of way. It's, it's close, but I think you can. Other committee members? No, what's Mike's agenda? Um, um, let's go to the liaison report. Uh, um, Sin, do you have anything? Oh, she probably left. She's at Parks and Rec now. Um, Ken, do you have anything from the TCMC? I think, uh, am, I, am I live now? Yes. Uh, I, I think I'm, uh, we're pretty well covered by comments already made. I don't think we need to go into anything else. I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. I can't raise my hand, so this That's is- That's okay. Oh. <laughs> we can hear you. Ken. How long has sure, your sure. committee, the trails committee, existed? You're talking uh, uh, the TCMC? Yes. Oh, several years. Uh, I don't know whether it's three or four or, or two, what, but two, 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 three, four years. Something like right? that. Yeah. Yeah. In those two or three, four years, your committee was created with your support by our committee, the Upper Charles Committee, uh, petitioning the, the select board to create your committee. Is that correct? There were petitions to the select board to create the committee, as I understand it, yes. Yeah, and it came from us. So let me ask you a serious question. When they created your committee, was part of 
what they created was a list of things that your committee was in charge of, one of which was supporting other trails committees. Is that true? I don't think any committee's ever been created that is obligated to support the conclusions of another committee. That would be pretty ridiculous. So no, I no, wouldn't that, That's what that you logic. think. But I, I want to suggest that you go back and look. Well, now, go ahead. I have a I have a question. That would be a ridiculous in the two committee or three in the two or three or four years that your committee has been in existence, other than critiquing the Upper Charles Committee, what have you initiated or accomplished? I mean, we've done a lot of resurfacing of trails. Uh, for example, the Hughes Trail. Uh, we've, no. we've been doing town-wide uh, surveys of uh, uh, what would be called by Gary's uh, verbiage, single track trails and even uh, more woodsy trails than that. We've actually focused a lot on that. Uh, the UCTC thing has been troublesome for us. But the reason we care about that is because it, 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 it's such a huge amount of to town resources going into that. And it does uh, have to do with issues that Gary Trendle did raise in his sidewalk survey so what the town wants and where that cash ought to go. But, you know, mostly the UC, uh, the TCMC has been focused on uh, other trails than the Upper Charles Trail. It's, it's really only been since this uh, focus on trying to put a whole lot of money down on the campus connector and going down Hayden Road that there's been objections by TCMC. And that's largely not been through the TCMC itself, but through other people in town that happen to be TCMC members. But it hasn't been a major point of discussion of TCMC itself for the most part. Ken, the reason you were created was to create trails other than the Upper Charles. And the only thing you've done is worry yourself to try to uh, look at the Upper Charles. I want to know. That's your opinion. What That's your opinion. I want, Go ahead. No, Ken, Ken, I want to know what Are you've you okay done. It, what you've done other than worry about the other Charles with the hundreds of miles of trails that exist in Hopkinton? It's just a ridiculous question. Take uh, a look at the town report. Jane, can I, uh, I, I, I can I interrupt? To pursue this this, yeah. this argument. This is just, right. just not right. It's out of order completely, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I'd like to say that I agree with Ken on that. I don't think the TCMC is relevant uh, right now to any of this, and that we're really going down the wrong. Um, we're going down the wrong pathway here by by pursuing this any further. Yeah, what I what I think Eric is observing is that there's a lot of us that are uh, cross cross functional on a lot of groups and entities, and uh, that may be part of the confusion. There's a lot of um, people working in a lot of different areas, but I don't I agree with uh, what was just said. Well, just to be clear, um, I think that um, the Upper Charles Trail is clearly trying to come up with a, a clear path. We've done a lot of work. And um, I think that what Eric is also feeling that it's too bad that another trails group who is supposed to be supporting all trails throughout town has found it in their heart to go against us and that's just too bad. And I think that's all he's pointing out. I see Mike has his hand up. Well, I just wanted to say that um, TCMC has supported me at Pratt Farm and Fruit Street uh, and Chuck at Fruit Street mm -hmm. extensively. Um, that's good. And I don't think that that's, um, and, and so Eric might have um, exaggerated a little bit that TCMC has done a lot 
to support single use paths all over town. I think a, a lot of the discussion may be just around the choice and it's a personal choice of a lot of folks. A lot of folks just don't think that they want, you know, a big wide path going through, through town, but that Hello Hopkinton and welcome back to the Hangout Hour. This HKM TV series, live most Wednesdays at 7 p.m., seeks to connect with you and connect you to our community. We bring you a mix of segments with people in positions that serve our community and we also want to hang out with you to see how you're doing and what you're up to lately. Here at HCAM, we like talking with you and sharing stories. So consider joining us. We're all friends and neighbors here. To connect with the Hangout Hour for yourself or to suggest another in our community, drop us an email or give us a call. Really, this is why we're here. Later in this program, I'll be talking with Sean McAuliffe of the Board of Health to get all the latest on the course of COVID in Hopkinton. And I'll be catching up with John Ritz about what he's been up to, but first, I have the pleasure of talking with Nanette Kenrick, who has written a book with the absolute best title, Secret Letters to My Psychiatrist. She's also involved with our Hopkinton Historical Society, so she's got a lot going on. Nanette, welcome to the Hangout Hour. Thank you for having me. It is definitely my pleasure. So <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about um, your work and your volunteerism and this, this uh, book that you wrote. But before that, I'd just like to talk a little bit about how you came uh, to be in our Hopkinton community. Well, I lived in Southboro for a great many years, and I was a single, and I was looking for some way to spend my time recreationally. And I joined the Hoffington Historical Society, and they had a uh, lecture series that was open on Sunday afternoons, and that fit right in with my schedule. Mm -hmm. And so it was great. I um, I used to come over every two months, go to the lectures. I met all these people from Hoffington. I had a so the motions for the minutes as distributed, have been voted unanimously, and so passed. Um, by the way, that's the 12-8-21. Uh, 12-8-22 minutes, right? Correct. Yes. Yes. Hey, Jane? Yes. This is Jim. Sorry, I'm on uh, my wife's computer, so it says Kate Connolly, but it's me. Oh, yeah. Hey, everybody. Hey. So welcome. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to be back. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's it's good to hear your voice, Jim. So Jim, did you get a chance to look at the minutes? I did. Okay. So Are you voting we'll, on them now? I will yeah, so we just vote okay. them on. Can we add your name? Okay, so yes, Jim please. votes in the positive to accept the minutes too. Great. Uh, he was absent that day. Yeah, that's correct. So he can abstain? Yes. Okay, very good. 
So, um, for topics for a next meeting. <laughs> Let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> You're brave. <laughs> I had actually thought about maybe coming up, with, I'll ask the committee to think about this. Would it be helpful if we did a public survey and asked more specific questions that we think may be relevant? No, until we have a way to do this that gets more than 300 people out of 20,000, no. <laughs> okay, anyone else have another opinion? Yes, I'd say uh, quite the opposite. If we don't do a public survey, we're not even trying to do what the town wants. And I think that our charge is to figure out what the town wants to do. Yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah. Does that mean that less than 2% of the people will lead our town? Well, who goes to town meeting? Is it 3%? Yeah, it's probably 3 less than 3%. It's, it's three, two and a half percent. So it's a different people. All alternative is to wait for town meeting to, to decide our fate. I mean, so one or the other. It might be the same people in both cases, in any case. Right. Yeah, it might and might not. Well, I'd say we, we at least try to seek out what the town wants. If we don't well, do that- Well, they come up think, with a statistically, uh, a statistically valid way of doing it, Ken. Well, uh, okay, so one way we could do it is put a question on the town uh, election as opposed to a town meeting, I suppose. I mean, we've got, we, is that possible? Uh, to town election is after town meeting. Yeah, that's right. So, but I'm asking, is that a way to, uh, to get a larger number of people involved? Is, I don't even know whether it's possible, but other petitioners on state elections can get questions proposed. Maybe we need to go that way. Well, why don't, like you, that. why don't you investigate it and bring it to our next meeting? Somebody probably knows um, right off the bat. I just don't. I think that uh, we could take a um, note of what the chairman of the planning board just recently accomplished. We had a subcommittee and we had discussions over a two or three month period trying to decide what kind of, where did, where did we think the town wanted to go and how, and that's how we came up with these questions that we ultimately asked. And I think that we were surprised at the end because we started off thinking that it was going to be one way and we ended up doing it the other way. But doing something like this for a subcommittee is a lot of work and it's, um, it's a big, it's a, it's a thought process. And to Eric's point, you only do get a small percentage of the pro uh, population that responds to these uh, types of surveys. But also that's just what you get when you do public surveys. Very, very small amount of people actually participate or care enough about the time. I think um, Gary and all of us were very surprised that we got, what was it, 368 responses? Yeah, 1.84% of yeah. our population. I, when my memory serves me correct, the last time we we were involved in a public survey. We only got like 200, just a little over 200. And I can, I suspect that there was extra interest in the um, connectivity, the trails connectivity survey, because of all of the discussions that are, are sur um, surrounding the trails between the TCMC and the Upper Charles Trail and the Trails Club. Uh, more people were actively listening at the time and took the time to respond. So I think that that was valuable information. And you're right, you're never going to get 100% of the people to respond to these, but it's, it's just a tool. It's just, it would be a thumbnail sketch of what um, people might be thinking. But it, so maybe if we did do a subcommittee, maybe it would be, we just find out if there's value in doing it or not. Um, or do we not have enough information to do that yet? Um, I, we're still in the midst of where we want to go. We're struggling with how to get down Hayden Row or around Hayden Row. So I think we just have some more work to do. And it might not be the right timing for a public survey, but I just put it out there so people can think about it a little bit. Jane, Jane I think we all need to think about it 
and talk about our next meeting. Okay. Anyone, I will put that on for next. I think that's a good idea. Um, does anyone else have an, so, um, a thoughts about our next meeting? Uh, this is Jim. I'll be on time for the next one. <laughs> Good. That's okay. We're just glad you're here. Let me run an idea by that I haven't thought of much at all. Uh, is it reasonable to think about asking the voters on each of these routes to individually weigh in on whether they want the trails to go by their their property? So, you know, on Hayden Road, we've got people uh, that would... Uh, be on the path. Uh, west of Charles View, we've got people that are on the path. Uh, got you know Gorman and uh, uh, Chirco and uh, uh, Danahy. Yeah, Danahy. And uh, I suppose maybe you'd give uh, whoever bought uh, Austria on these property a vote. Of, I, I I don't know how to do it, but uh, those key abutters have them weigh in. Have the ones on Hayden Row weigh in, and just count up uh, how many people. Uh, there are key abutters that are in a position to block alternative trail routes. Think about it. If that's, yeah, I mean, is, is that the right, I don't know that that's the right metric. It's just one metric, but I'll, what's the I'll right agree, metric? I'll agree with that. If you go into every neighborhood and see if they want unidentified parked cars in front of their house, looking at their kids playing in their yards. So uh, we're talking about abutters that the trail would actually go over the property, not not just people that are near no, the no, property. I looked, I, no, no, I'm looking at the proposal through neighborhoods, Ken. Nobody's going on. through neighborhoods. Yeah, exactly. Well, anyway, so Thank maybe you. that would be a discussion for a little subcommittee to get together and hash this out. Yeah. That, anyway, that's that, what's that, the right that, that that answer? Okay, uh, <laughs> Jane, I agree with you 100%. Okay, I don't, yeah, we, I think a better place for that is in a little subcommittee. Um, so we'll have Ken and Eric and a referee. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, oh, Jane, <laughs> yes. I do think that's a good, I think Can that's I a good point. Can I be part of the Eric. audience? <laughs> no, no. If we're going to meet, I want you all there to watch. <laughs> uh, oh, this is what I love about this group. And I want to just say, I've agreed with Ken, this meeting and last meeting, and after nine years on this committee, that's a big deal. Yeah. No, we're so doing actually, good. I think we've had a lot of consensus along the way. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, um, having said all of that, I will try and come up with some more topics uh, for next meeting. And uh, right now, unless there's anything else, I will take a motion to. Uh, I make a motion to adjourn. Me. Do I hear a second? I second it. I second. Okay. Um, as I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Eric Sonnet. Yes. Ken Parker. Yes. Eli Post. Yes. Barry Rosenblum. Yes. Bar Bob Snyder. Yes. Um, let's see, Jim Sorello. Yes. And Jane Moran is a yes. Okay, thank you, everyone. This has been a very lively discussion, and we'll look forward to doing it again real soon. Yeah, Eric and I have almost always voted together on a journey in the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. We end on a positive note. Good right job. When well, they're the all laughing, it's good. Who took oh, yeah. it? Did Eric take the, the minutes tonight? Elaine did. Okay. All right. And thank uh, you, really? Michelle. Thank you, Wonderful. Dave. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> thank you, Elaine. Yeah, good night. Thank you, You're Elaine. very brave to join this group. Good night. <laughs> good, good night, night, everyone. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye.